Many people in life are looking for how to make a living. They're looking for how to make retirement work, and they're really trying to figure out how to find the right love in their life that makes them sing and makes them light up like a holiday ornament and maybe makes them even light up like a Christmas tree. In my lifetime, I've had a few loves, and I know what that's like. It's like having someone so in love with you that mostly you're pretty much happy all the time. There are many people who just pick the first person that comes along. There are many people who think that a good-looking face or an attractive, well-proportioned body is the right pick for their life. And then later they find out that it's not exactly right, that other people felt the same, and that individual is not really loyal to that love that they've provided them. In life, we have to look to what the Heavenly Father and Divine Mother has said about our life, and in particular, what our life plan and life course is going to be. And then we have to align ourselves with partners with similar interests and similar goals and the ability to complement one another in a way that makes the most logical sense to move forward in life into victory. How many people actually stop and make a list of the things that they want that individual to prepare for them in order to be openly, honestly, positively, 100 and literally percent sure that that individual was sent by God to become their life partner. In life, some people produce a list of if this individual has a handful of items on them or physically with their person, then I'll know that they were sent by God. Other people provide character traits and they decide, I want a person with the character who's just like this and has all these wonderful qualities about them so that I can feel the most safe, secure, loved, and basically become in love with that individual because I personally and practically enjoy those types of characteristics in the human form that Lord God might send to me to provide me love, honor, dignity, and matrimony. In our lifetime, we have the opportunity to have many loves. I have an old professoral type of spiritual teacher who works in the broader political area who would often say that, that there are many loves that we can have in a lifetime. But the truth is, and practically is, the Lord sends only a handful. He sends a handful for a lot of reasons. He sends them to help prepare us for something that's coming for us in the literal future. He sends someone for companionship to help produce offspring. And then he might send someone literally who is the actual prepared mate for that individual that the Lord has chosen for them for the rest of their life. And sometimes we discover them right off the first pick and it's everything wonderful from that day forward. And there are many old couples who talk about how they found each other, how they made it, and how they became lifelong partners. There are other people who struggled in life. They picked the wrong people because of various imperfections in their souls and things and special uh, events that they had to do. And they literally got off track in life. Their entire life seemed to fall apart. Then we have people who sort of meet that person along the way, and they don't realize at all who that individual is supposed to be for them. They just don't get it because they're not thinking about love with that person in the same way of a physical attraction that many people feel in terms of chemistry with an individual. But you see, chemistry is usually intellectual and emotional. It's not always psychological or physical. And that's something that we have to think about, that the Lord God knows our souls and our individual personality and communication styles so well that he and she in heaven will openly pick that individual for us based on what we need to learn how we need to grow, and more importantly, what sort of things we can provide back to that individual in terms of honor, matrimony, and service to move our family's lives forward in ways we would have never possibly dreamed of. You see, the Lord's plan is always the highest in the land. It's not about our wishes sometimes. It's not even about our preferences a lot of times. It's totally about how much we love the Lord and decide that the Lord might know more about the world and the people in it than we do in general. Practically, we have to be somewhat simple. Are we providing ourselves the opportunities to meet that individual? Are we going to the right places to find the right kind of people? Are we literally hanging out in the right sort of positions? And in truth, are we openly getting precisely what we want? Or are we really allowing the Lord to select for us the best individual for the rest of our lives? You see, there's the lies in the difference. Many people can spot an attractive individual and go, wow, I want to get with that person. But in truth, we don't know much about their longevity. We don't know much about their ability to mate for life. We don't know much about their ability to be loyal and faithful and not have any infidelity in the relationship. And we don't know about their prowling eye and whether or not they'll really 
stay with us for the rest of our lives. Sometimes they come in to just provide us the blessing of children, and a lot of times that's taken away from us because the people around us who want to poo-poo how we already had children, and they think that literally we should stay single because of our children or things like that. But the Lord always prepares another companion, another life partner, because in life we're supposed to be partnered. We're supposed to be making strategic alliances. We're supposed to be making great relationships in our businesses. And let's face it, the entire world is working in business. If we're employed, if we're self-employed, if we're a resource provider in terms of time, energy, uh, money, or any other type of stock, bonds, literally any type of family assets that we've been inherited, that is openly what we are providing in our relationship to the next person most of the time. Presumably, it's a healthy relationship, presuming there's not so many millions of dollars that we really need to have prenuptial agreements. But in truth, most of us are prepared to live life the long term with a partner. That's usually what our bodies are generally designed for, and it's openly what our souls are sort of set up to do. In my lifetime, I've only loved a handful of women, and that's something I share about in my book, Soul Keepers. And I talk about how these women that I met along the way just transformed my life in one way or another. One woman from a foreign land helped me to learn about a lot of things in terms of relationships, in terms of long-term care of one another, in terms of caring in a way that made us an, a great old couple early on. We sort of knew each other really well. We knew what to say. We knew what to do. And we provided for self a life worth living. We also helped one another in a lot of different ways up in our opposing cultures. We sometimes would even argue in that foreign language and switch back and forth between the languages. And some of our bilingual friends would really joke and laugh about how funny it was to listen to us because we would just shift languages based on the words that we needed to say to each other. And they sort of liked that. They saw it as a comedy routine, but they also understood the relationship because they had already been studying uh, addition, additional languages. And people who are multilingual sort of get that. The other reality is that we're looking at how do we produce life partners, life partnerships that will help us to soar, that will help us to raise ourselves up, that will keep our vibrations so high in the song of our life that we will just simply excel in ways we never would have thought of because we met that individual, they changed our lives, and they literally came into our life to do a bunch of things, perhaps to find us healing from a bad relationship, openly perhaps to help us with our children to become better parents, perhaps to help us to be a mentor in ways that we needed in business or to complement what we do in our skill sets so that we can become even richer in life in terms of not only physical, uh, excuse me, financial att attributes that we literally need to produce for ourselves a life worth living and retirement with having, but also the ability to simply provide for our families as we grow old. You see, retirement is something that most of us don't really think about. We're so busy living in the day-to-day. -day. We're so busy with the struggle of parenting. We're so busy interacting with people that just make our lives either really good sometimes and really bad other times, or we're just worried all the time about whether or not they'll be faithful, that it's maybe not be the right fit for us. But openly, we're trying to produce a family, and that family is the one that will love us into our old age. They'll be the ones who'll be changing our diapers, literally wiping our noses and our asses, and openly, I hate to say it that way, but that was how it was with my father. My father was a very powerful man in my mind based on what I could see him do, based on his intellect and how he basically could sit for the valedictorian spot in high school, and he missed it by a few points because he never took a test or, or a course that he decided to sit for the test for, which was sort of an amazing thing, I thought. He also produced for himself a life worth living based on working for the same company for 42 years of his life, during a time period when people really did that. They got in, they were loyal, they stayed a long term, and the companies really took care of them with financial packages when they retired. Those days are sort of a little bit gone, not completely, but they can be in finding those companies to work in, those larger-than-life companies that really understood the purpose of family, the ability to give stocks, bonds, benefits, and other things are sort of shifting away from us now. It's become openly a uh, defend and uh, defend your life sort of situation with a lot of people in terms of their work opportunities. If we're not getting into the right circles of influence, if we're not really preparing ourselves for social skills, if we're not really work, learning how to talk to people and listen to them and how to make them feel good, not in a manipulative sort of way, but just to help them to see themselves in a positive light, it's really a difference in how what might happen to us in our lives and where we might go. Sometimes it's late in life when we really discover what we really are excellent at, the things that God has gifted us, our skill sets, what we can see to help the world, and what we can do or sell to make ourselves a real living. In my lifetime, I've had multiple career options. I began my photography studio literally in my early high school days, and I brought in people from that community and had them in my basement of all places 
which wasn't the most finished, beautiful thing like you'd have in an affluent community, but I literally set up lights, hooked them to ladders, did all sorts of stuff, and produced some wonderful shots of those men and women at the time for their lives, and they all loved them. And many of them had their parents purchasing additional copies. From there, I moved into photographic sales and did quite well, winning a stellar opportunity with Nikon uh, cameras in which I was awarded a BMW uh, 318i uh, four-door white sedan, basically, from my sales affluence and influence. I was always outselling the older people because I simply learned how to qualify the customer, give them precisely what they're looking for, and make sure they felt confident and good about the decisions they made in that shop that day. There was only one time when I made a mistake in that opportunity because we had a foreigner come in and try to steal from us on a holiday season. And he literally did thousands of dollars worth, and I was mortified. He said his credit card wasn't working well, and I didn't have enough skill sets or training to know how to handle that situation. I let him walk out the door without expecting any problem with the card. That was a major mistake, but I learned from it so well. There was another time when I professionally was just hanging out, being in college and saying silly stuff with the person that I was just trying to have one upsmanship and literally one of the customers heard us. I was mortified in that situation, but you learn from these situations how to live, how to speak, how to do things. I have a fabulous eldest sister who helped me with a lot of language development and literally then I built a <coughs> intellectual library for a manufacturing company that I was working in as a, a, a little interpreter. It was a challenging job because after that point, I'd already been off to Japan. I'd learned to speak the language pretty fluently, socially and otherwise. And yet there was always something new to learn in manufacturing and engineering terminology. And I produced for myself with the help of that company, as well as the handful of Japanese ladies that I knew, a bilingual dictionary. Sadly, that dictionary had pages ripped from it out of my last home, stolen completely out of the, all the work that we did as a group that we were planning to produce for the world. And now I have partial aspects of that work left. If I'm lucky, it's still in my unit. It might not be. The photocopies with all our handwritten notes on it could be completely gone. But that's the world in which we live in. From there, I literally built a <clears throat> traveling photography business. And I traveled the nation photographing companies on behalf of another company as an independent contractor. I also learned that at that time, the web development was coming into the rage. And I decided to shift my technological influences to learn about that. I learned HTML with the great difficulty of not being a coder and not being mathematically well endowed in those areas. And then I literally learned how to switch from different companies and different programs that became popular from Dreamweaver to all sorts of other things that have sort of faded into the background. And we've emerged with all sorts of new technologies from Adobe, thankfully, and other companies like Microsoft and even more like Sony. One of my favorite programs for doing video editing, I literally spent thousand plus dollars to go to a web university that was run by a man who did such a profoundly great job in educating us on how to utilize that software and he really deserved every penny that we sent him. He produced an incredible video series program and I know it provided for his life a long time. Maybe it's still out there. Along the way I of course built a Japanese language school because my family was Japanese and I was looking at the long-term capabilities of our lives and how do we produce a life worth living together so that everyone is feeling good about their skill sets, about their ability to be of that culture, so that they would never be dishonored by Americans who so literally take foreign cultures for granted. Unfortunately, there was a lot of struggle in that family unit. I went to a lot of different meetings for my child because ESL of that time in that community was just treated as a blanket white sheet that everybody, no matter what their country was, got the same treatment. Well, for most children that worked, but for most I know it didn't. But the school system wanted to believe that it did, and we ended up in a lot of litigation-oriented things on behalf of our child to make sure that things would really work for them. And sometimes in life, we need to have that person who's literally saying things. Now, at that time, I had to be both a parent as well as an interpreter, and that was difficult because when your emotions are high, when you're seeing your child totally transgressed against, when the relationship of your life is not really the business of the school, your job is to do your job and translate. There were many times that I spoke under my breath and I cursed a lot, and that wasn't very professional, but I was just frustrated to hell with the lies that I was being told by those people in that organization, and I won't say what the school system was because that would be inappropriate and unprofessional. But openly, I had the full license of that woman in that room to represent her family, her child in America. And that was my lawful right based on financial investment, based on practical aspect of us living together, and based on a lot of other aspects of our relationship, which is no one's business but my own. 
You see, in life, we have moments of time to make a huge difference for other people. And right now is the moment in time for the love of my life. You see, the love of my life actually came into my life based on a huge prayer that I literally knelt down on my knees and I said, Lord, if I'm not getting where you expect me to go, if this person I'm with is not the one beyond just personal training for my life and how to be in a relationship with someone, then please, Lord, help all this to come to pass so that that individual will not only pick and choose where she heads away from my life, but the individual that I'm supposed to meet that you have planned for my life will come into my life. And in that moment of time, in walked an amazing, incredible professional individual whose life totally wrapped into mine and became one of my closest, dearest people that I love to spend time with on the telephone, through texting, and literally in her presence. When I was in her presence, I would light up like a Christmas tree, and I literally would get information prophetically, not only about her life and what I should do in silly moments of time and what to wear to be actually matching her as if we were a couple, and it wasn't something that I set out to do, it just sort of literally began to happen, but also in terms of what professionally and practically we could do in one another's lives to help one another propel ourselves into the superior aspect of life that we openly needed to do. Unfortunately, that relationship kind of took a sour turn because of other players in our lives, my own partnership in my life and hers. And that was a difficult situation because how do you maneuver yourself carefully, gently away from people who are not appropriate for us or not equally yoked to us into other relationships that are perfectly healthy for us and superiorly, obviously, what the Lord God wants in our life. And here is how it began. It began with, I kept running into people with the same little name. Almost every business setting I went into had the exact same name popping up in that setting, whether I'd go to church, whether I'd go to a place at the community centers, whether I would go anywhere in a networking professional event, there would be always someone whose voice would be raised up in that particular event that was actually hers. From there, it was something that happened when I traveled. Literally every place I would go, there would be, when I was in the moments of time of thinking about her, missing her life in mine, I literally would have a car with her initials drive right in front of me almost at the precise exact time. I've also had many moments of time when I felt despair and to raise me up, to give me hope, the Lord put that type of car in front of me. There was a handful of cars that I would get that would sort of remind me of her life and the hope that I need to carry into my world for that beginning of a life with her. It took a long time to bring about any type of changes openly within myself and within my own abilities to understand what the Lord's path was for me in my life and my journey and where we were practically going to go as a life. You see, sometimes we go through all these learning processes, all these stages of our employment, all these stages of practically providing a living for self, even to the point of utter loss, to realize the plan that the Lord God has for our life. In my situation, while I was kind of still in relationship with her, she provided for me an introduction to a tool. I didn't never heard of it before, never understood it before, but it was something somewhat metaphysical, something somewhat spiritual, something someone out of a Catholic realm, and openly, neither one of us was Catholic. So it was sort of comical, but when I was able to use it in the first two seconds of trying it, it changed my life. It has given me such mayhem and such magic that I can't get over it, and it has become a part of my Christian faith practice. I literally can tell who's who in a matter of seconds, and prophetically I'm gaining much more wisdom as I go along, because I've provided my Lord in heaven all the submissions that he needs. No matter what it is, no matter how silly, no matter how practical, no matter how related to my own physical body, he, you, and she, Lord, Mother and Father God, rules it all. There is no one who can make me waver, really, from that path, unless the Lord says it's okay. And sometimes I waver from what maybe is exactly perfect for me, so that I learn a lesson in life. Now, something lesson in life, we were headed into the winter months. And in the winter months, we have to be much more <clears throat> individually understanding of the little weather. It has turned incredibly freezing in the early months of November, which I've never remembered in the past. Usually we have kind of a mild fall and it slowly pro progresses into late December when we get these freezing cold rains, when we get these ice on the floor, on the ground, when we get snow. But again, global warming and our production of industry has impacted the earth. And Mother Earth is not really happy with all that we've done to her and all that we do to destroy her. But literally there are conservative groups that are trying to help protect all sorts of wildlife, all sorts of in weather inclements, and openly we need to do that not only for the survival of our species, but just to protect ourselves from the other types of species that might literally be out there in some cyber, in some, excuse me, uh, astral plane that we are not familiar with or in a different dimension. 
And we've had enough uh, marketing now from the Hollywood area to know that that is literally possible. We have to prepare ourselves from the minds that Lord God can make amazing species. And they all have different languages, cultures, peoples, communication styles, eating habits, and God forbid, there might be predators only to us, which might be why we get some of those films out of Hollywood, to prepare ourselves for those things. Let's face it, Star Wars, Star Wars and Star Trek created incredible next generations of students, children, people who and fans who love that sort of thing. There was also a really gruesome one that came out, Attack from Mars or something like that, which I really hated, but it did show the little possibility that there might be some out there that don't really particularly care for us. Now, why am I talking about love and aliens and all sorts of things in this individual audio cast is to prepare your mind for the real fact that in life we have one moment in time to make a difference sometimes to change the life of a person completely around so that they get back on track in life. Many people profess to help others, but when it comes to sticking it out for the long term, how many programs literally do that? How many programs interlock themselves with other programs in the world to actually provide for themselves the opportunities to change lives completely through stair steps programs, shifting people from one program logically to the next? So many police officers are out there in the land, but what are they doing exactly when they're not solving crimes when they're not taking bad guys to jail? What exactly educational programs are they involved with in their squad cars? What are they listening to to produce for themselves the mindset of how to talk to all sorts of people and all sorts of different types of social groups? And what are they learning to become cultural liaison between the communities that sometimes have cultural rifts between one another? Are the gang wars really openly over with? Are they just beginning? Are we literally allowing people to purchase weapons in a way that's appropriate? Do we have the appropriate gun laws in place? I mean, how much of this is very difficult to solve? Not much. The truth is all we need is practical leaders, logical aspects of figuring out and whiteboarding what is good for all involved. And practically, that's where a politician comes in handy. I've only known one gal in life who'd be worthy of being a politician, and I said so when I moved through the Illinois community. I said, this town needs a mayor, and you could be it. Whether or not she got that text, whether or not she got that tweet, I don't really know, and I don't really remember because I am getting older. And it's true. As we age, things start to happen to our mind, things start to happen to our body, and practically things start to happen on the cellular level. So let's get to that point. I am marketing a product that I have chosen mainly for a couple reasons. First of all, my father, who is a very superior business mind and practical in terms of money and numbers and produced for himself quite a life worth living and an excellent retirement worth having, which put no burden on his children whatsoever, literally liked the program, liked the product, and generally liked the people. He found some annoyance with some of the people, but hey, older folks in life have the ability to be persnickety, especially if they did not produce for themselves a life worth living and a retirement worth having many of whom husbands are still working late into their retirement years because there was no income provided. They married late in life. Who knows what the actual story is, but openly people do miss out on opportunities in life as well. You see, in our lifetime, we meet a handful of people that I would like to call our core soul group. And that soul group, as we collect them over the course of our life, help us to move our lives into something that the Lord has planned for us our actual Lord-given plan for our life. And when I say Lord, I'm talking about Mother and Father God, and which are practically in the Bible and Genesis, which the uh, com community of Narcissi might have shifted language on. We don't have all the actual aspect of our physical Bible or any of the other historic philosophical works around the world from religions, from the, the actual uh, presentation of the Tower of Babel by the Lord himself and herself. But openly, I'm not talking about anything illogical. I'm talking about what we learn in our religious studies courses, in our Bible classes, and in our, in our Sunday schools, that we really don't know as much as we should. And the Vatican knows a hell of a lot more than the rest of us do because of all the priests and what they study all day long. Who wouldn't love to go there and just walk their library aisles and ask somebody for a quick translation of something we're looking for about spirituality and our own life to shift our consciousness to literally move us forward in ways that we couldn't possibly imagine because it's what the Lord has put in our souls to be concerned with. So many people are so off track in their understanding of God and their religious practices, it's not even funny, according to the Lord that I use in my life, but prophetically, I have a lot more gifts than most people. I don't know. The other reason is that I actually pursue those gifts so that it keeps me literally safe, provides for me a living. And actually, even in the most humblest of moments of poverty, when I follow the Lord's plan, I get precisely what I'm looking for. And every time I praise God, I literally thank him and her for their kindness, for their love, and for what they're doing to put food on my humble table and a roof over my house head in the coldest months of winter. Now, I was starting to talk a little bit about that. 
I'd like to say you are a fucking idiot, excuse the language, for those folks in Radio Land, but the website and internet is a little different. We don't have the same FCC rules, so I'm going to be bold. I'm going to make sure I say something that's practically loud enough that these moronic parents and their children get. You're an absolute utter fool if you don't leave the house without the appropriate clothing. Pull those damn pants up. Get out of your shorts. Put on long johns if you have to. Put on proper shoes, proper socks if it's appropriate to you. I had a love who could not wear socks because of how it made her feet swell, and that's okay, but her feet were hotter than smet, than coal. And openly, when I talk about this, I'm talking about practicality. If your car has a failure that you're not planning to, if some predator decides to ruin your car, if they decide to remove your gas when you're shopping, if they do anything at all that allows you to think you're going someplace, but then you discover you're not, you are literally stuck in the freezing cold, inappropriately dressed, and not prepared for the winter months that the Lord has provided us here in the land of Indiana or any other state across the land. Have I made myself clear enough, or are you such a moron that you didn't learn something in health classes, you didn't learn something in science and weather classes, to realize that if it's going to rain, you literally need a rain poncho of some sort in the car? Are you so foolish that you don't believe that you need sleeping bags or other types of blankets in the vehicle in case your car gets stuck in the little snow or ice and can't move any further? You could actually freeze to death, and I can tell you something about that because the last several nights of this last week have been utterly freezing. And when I wake up, my feet feel like icicles. And frankly, it's not because I don't have a home. It's because literally I was uh, unprofessionally handled in my last home to the point that it's almost ruined my actual name. Now, when I talk about these realities of the world, I'm not talking about giving my story away. I'm saying this is what we live in. We live in a society that people lie, people steal, people take things away from us literally when we're not expecting it. And openly, they destroy our lives. There are other people who come into our lives just in the nick of time to save us. There are other people who pounce on us, who decide to take advantage of those moments in time, and they are literally so off God's path that it's not even funny in life. I know that the people who lied about me, the people who stole from me, the people who keep messing with my automobile against the wills of not only the law of the land, but my personal wishes, as on top of the laws of which should be governing the safety in our vehicles, like the one I drive, actually, should not be allowing anyone to unlock my car at any moment in time, whether I'm in it or not, to take one damn thing from my physical home while I'm traveling. Because that's practically what our cars are. They are actually our homes when we travel. They keep us safe on the road. They speed our abilities to get places and get to jobs and get to employment and get to the places we are longing to see that the Lord has put in our soul that we're trying to get to. But openly, there's some practical things there. Every single car should have a couple things in terms of an emergency kit. They should literally have a two-gallon gas tank that has gas in it. Now, a lot of people are leery of traveling with gas, but in the winter months, we should probably travel with a little bit and then put it in our trunk and lock down securely and make sure the cap is on well. And then you've got to burp it every so often because gas does produce in this current day and age, perhaps not in old days and age when we had a lot more gas available, but there's a lot of air bubbles in gas, and that can produce lies at the gas tank and at the gas pump, which we can talk about in another audio cast. But in truth, it can look like we got our full tank of gas, but maybe because of the air bubbles, we only got a half tank. Or maybe because of the gas game, we only got a half tank because half of our gas was redirected to another pump, the friend of someone who's literally working in a station who's being dishonest, who's stealing money out of our pockets. We can talk about banks and how they're sort of shifting to doing that out of our paycheck. And I literally almost went through the roof, but I'm not producing a paycheck at the moment, so I wasn't as pissed off as I should have been. But literally, there are people who just want to steal from us our rightfully earned money. Now, when I'm talking about these car kits, I'm talking about a lot of things. We need to have emergency blankets, and emergency blankets mean something wool. You have to have a blanket with wool in it in order to stay truly warm in a vehicle. You also have to have a sleeping bag practically that costs a little penny while you can get them lovely sleeping bags for any other time of year from Walmart and Target for 10 to $20, and they do work pretty well in those moments. When it comes to winter months, it has to be able to go below freezing, which means you're going to spend a pretty penny either at a specialty mountaining store or at a practical online discount store to find one. Make sure it's large enough for you and whoever's in it, and you can unzip it to share. You also have to have seat covers that I prefer and believe need to have some wool in it. Sometimes just good old-fashioned wool blankets that you loan to an elder person when they're in your car and the air conditioning is on because they get colder than we normally do as, as young people is an appropriate thing to lay over the seat. It's also something to put over your legs to keep you warm. Now, dealing with your feet is to actually taking your shoes off if you get stuck in the car, putting them up on the dashboard closest to you as possible, not up against the windshield for a lot of reasons to keep them warmer. 
but then there's the dethawing of our feet after a cold night if we're stuck, and that is a hard part. We literally have to sit on them a little bit, one at a time if we can't do it Indian style, to warm our feet up against our own body temperatures. And that's something the Lord has produced for us in a way that's loving, honoring, and care. Let's face it, the people of old, the folks who ran around in burlap and, and wolves skins and all sorts of animal skins when we didn't have true clothing, were uh, before that was emerged as a technological resource that God put into someone's brain, literally had to prepare themselves for these harsh winters. And openly, they had to put things on their feet that made sense to walk through snow, to walk through snowdrifts, to walk through any type of ice, and that's hard. Our shoes today are shit. We import the most worst type of shoes. We do it to keep our prices low in America, but we're also filling our landfills with a whole bunch of crap, and it's time to shift that over. Our shoes today literally need to have soles on them that will insulate us from the earth when it's frozen. We used to have winter boots. I can remember having moon boots when I was in junior high. And while they looked ridiculous, they actually kept us off the ground. They kept us pretty safe. And they kept our legs up to our calves quite warm. And that was wonderful unless they were crappy boots and then they leaked in the winter rains and in the snow. But openly, we also wore double socks. We took extra shoes in our bags and we always had a way to stay warm. I find it beyond appalling when I see when and women who might be hot-blooded, walking around with none of that. I'm a bit pissed off at my birth mother because, in truth, I had a pair of gloves I inherited from my father in my console as well as an Air Force hat that I literally was gifted out of my father's belongings. When I had to stay at my mom's house for a short period of time before her company that she pays millions of dollars to a year, at least that's what it feels like to me based on what they pay per rent per month, sort of pushed me out of being able to stay there based on the lies of staff and other people who just have no social skills whatsoever and perhaps participating with family harassment. Literally, I lost those things because why? My mother violated my rights, went through my belongings and took them out. So all I'm stuck with is a pair of muscle-oriented gloves that I've had most of my adult life that I used for weightlifting. I had another pair of weightlifting gongs that are completely stolen from my car. But the gloves I was wearing that were marked polo, which I always thought of as girly, which I didn't wear very often unless I was with a dress jacket, literally did not keep my hands warm these past week. So I simply produced for myself these gloves. They allow me to use my fingertips. They keep my hands reasonably warm, but they're not exactly great for winter. And I'm pissed as hell at my mom that she would steal those back from me. First of all, because they were my father's and the only few things that I had of him. But second of all, because I really could have used them this week. And that was her fault and her lie in her mind that she should take them back. But they were her husband's. So if she wanted them back, she should have told me and not just pilfered them. And she should have provided for me something in place of it because I was planning to use them in these crazy months of winter. Could have also used that Air Force hat, even though I hate cotton type beanie hats, simply because it would have been warmer than the ones that I prefer to wear, which are more of a fleece and have a little bit more head breathing room. You see, I'm one of those guys who doesn't like constriction around any part of his body. It's not true that my pants are literally falling down completely all the time now in the three or four pairs that I wear to keep myself warm because I haven't been able to get out to my storage unit to get my long johns, which may or may not still be there based on anyone who might practically be going into my my belongings from my home and taking things thinking they had some appropriate right to do so. Now, this audio cast is waxing on. It's literally regurgitating some things I've already told in the story about my life. But what are you doing in your life to keep yourself warm as the winter months come forward? Have you literally purchased a leather coat? Leather has sort of gone out of fashion and really needs to come back in fashion because leather is amongst the warmest thing. But it has to have some sort of insulated lining. We have to warm it up a little bit by sitting on it on the back side of it so that it will be warm when we turn it around against the other portions of our seat. We also have to have blankets in our vehicle. We have to have boots that are appropriate. And we have to have extra pairs of socks and extra clothing in case we're there for a few days. You also have to learn how to pee in your own car. How many of you actually know how to do that? If you can't get out of the car, if the door is stuck, or if literally it's too cold to walk anywhere and get into a place because it's 3 in the morning and there are so many restaurants that are open and drive through but they won't open the door for a traveler. That happened to me the other night at several fast food restaurants where I literally, as out of gas, was trying to find some in the middle of the morning. Not only could I not get a, an attendant to open the locked door of a gas station, but it was ridiculously cold. And that's foolishness. Sure, I get they're trying to avoid against theft and other problems, but that is a societal problem that we've allowed to be produced. That we have not failed to educate people, not only have we failed to educate people in our little classrooms about theft and property rights, we have so failed that the foreigners of our land come in and literally try to take things. 
while we're in the gas station even. They literally tried to unlock our locks on our car doors, which should not be possible by anyone else other than us with a key fob, and they take stuff out of our car if we leave it unlocked or locked. Those are stories for another day, but openly I'm telling you, it's time to get off your butt, come to be the actual uh, <clears throat> savior of people in our lives who are going through struggle. Now, how you help someone in winter is help them put together a loving kit, maybe a Christmas gift of the things they need. Jumper cables, uh, pen lights, or basically dollar store lights that can hang in a vehicle if necessary. I love these little dollar store lanterns that they sell. I encourage you all to go buy one. They come in a variety of colors and they're great. They kept getting stolen from my home and my apartment. And that pissed me off because not because of the price, but because they were so useful to me. You can literally hang them on a necklace and walk around at night, which is wonderful. You can also hang them in a vehicle if it's got a sun or moonroof like I do, and it helps me to save the battery on my car. There's a lot of other things we need in that vehicle kit, but mainly you need appropriate clothing when you go out. You need jackets, even if you take them off because you're hot, to carry with you. Too bad it's a pain. Your children need to grow up and mature that they are responsible for keeping their human bodies safe, sound, and free of illness. Now, I'm sounding a bit more like a pastor these days, and that's because my life is shifting into that area, and after my marriage, I plan to do more and more speaking. Not regular, not full-time, but just enough to promote my work of my book, to talk about how Lord God can show you your life, literally put you on a path to success and financial incredible uh, opportunities, but also to keep you in line with the right people of your soul group. And we'll talk more about that in another audio cast. Now, it's literally time for me to close this up because I've got to figure out how I'm going to get out of this car that has literally been frozen shut. I can see glass <laughs> uh, of my windshield completely covered in a good couple layers of ice from the freezing rain. And openly, Lord God gifted me the prophetic understanding of how to protect my door. So at night, during this process of being homeless and living in a vehicle in through the freezing months, of how to make sure I'll be able to get out of the vehicle to get water, food, and everything else I need in life. You see, there's some things we also need in that kit, such as a reflective blanket that you can put on the ground and kneel on if you have to take things out of the car and check your belongings, but also it's reflective on one side, it has another color on the other, so that if you need to, you can hook it with bungee cords to your car to protect the seams of your vehicle so that your locks don't freeze. So that's my final tip to you as a homeless man who practically is getting information literally from Lord God in heaven, and I don't give a shit if you don't believe me, come test me and we'll just see. You see, in life, you have to test the people who have gifts of the Spirit, and everyone, literally, who is born unto the world is, is born by the Lord by giving that personal soul into the human form through the parents and lineage that they have. And I don't want to hear one more damn pastor, Christian, or any person of a religious background say that any human being based on their sexual orientation or their little aspects of their life was not born unto God. How vehemently ill-willed can you be? If we believe all the passages as it's current within the Bible, it says damn clear, Lord God made them all. How dare you judge someone based on anything they do in their intimate realms of their life? And how dare you turn that into the most ridiculous marketing scheme of the land? It's not about our rights matter too, it's that everyone's rights in this land matter with regard to who we choose to love how we choose to conduct that relationship. And as long as it's not harming that person or any other type of person or creature that the Lord made, that's between two people in a private moment. Don't you ever go there again, you pastors, because that is an abomination unto the Lord. And I'm going to tell you that straight off as someone with prophetic gifts that would rock your friggin' world. But openly, I'm just professing who I am now. I'm not afraid to talk about who I am. I'm not afraid to talk about who I love, although I am being conscientious that she may not love me back the same but I'll tell you this, little girl, if you don't get off your ass and come get me out of this vehicle and do what the Lord is asking of you, your life will continue to go to shit. And if you haven't realized that your life has gone that way because of how you treated me, you're out of your mind. Now, that's just a man putting it out there. I madly, passionately in love with you, wanted to marry you within seconds of meeting you. And I knew because every single minute of the day, God put you in my heart, mind, and soul. Don't you ever think I haven't loved you across this many months of and years possibly of not seeing you? Don't you ever think I didn't wake up every morning thinking about your life? Don't you ever think I didn't stop fully praying for your children to grow into wonderful uh, men and possibly other aspects of your life? Don't you ever believe it? But I've gone through my own struggle and I'm looking for you now. This has been Blake Ensign of Blaze Communications talking about real things, real life, real love, real politics, 
real aspects of the world in which we live to treat a life and create a life worth living and a retirement which is so essential to growing old in the world worth having. Make today this snowy, freezing, not totally sure what kind of day because I can't see out the windows right now, wonderful, impressive day for others who surround your life. Stop the selfishness in the world. Stop thinking of the right to pilfer things from other people. Stop worrying about who's with who and just get off your butts and do the best to make this world in America the safest, cleanest, and most incredible place in which we live.